done. Amen. Let's thank them again. Thank you, Rachel. Amen. Well, good morning. Oh, I can hear you. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to the worship and word of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're very grateful that you are with us today. Uh, thank you so much for joining us in the house of the Lord and, and online in the house of the Lord. Amen. And uh, we also want to especially welcome all of you dads among us, both in the cathedral and at home. And I want to wish my dad a very happy Father's Day. And uh, may all of you have a blessed day in the Lord with your family. 
I pray that the Lord would give you some strength today, some grace, some rest, and even maybe a nice meal or two. But um, uh, gentlemen, you are a significant gift, not only to the body of Christ, not only to this uh, house of the Lord, but you're a significant gift to society. And even though society doesn't necessarily recognize that gift right now, you are a gift to society, and we thank God for you. Amen. We are in a prophetic moment. God is changing the way church behaves. He's changing the way and the things that we call church. He is doing an incredible work, and the lawn is getting richer of revival. The Lord is moving. He's moving in the earth, and there's a mighty, mighty, mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost that is taking place. You say, well, when, Pastor? It's taking place in various spots in the world right now, and even in our own hearts and even in our own lives, we are hearing reports of the miraculous and reports of revival. Let us never go back to a business as usual church experience. Let us be on the edge and on the cusp of everything that God is doing. Let us be bold in our witness, bold in our worship, bold in our love, and let us take the good news of the kingdom of God to all the world as a testimony to every nation. Let us embrace the times that God has given us in which to live and in which to serve. Thank you Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, let's thank him. Hallelujah. Stand with me, church. Let's thank the Lord together. Father, we we give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. We hold your name in the highest of esteem. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Lord, this has been a difficult year, a difficult season. Some of our dear ones have come and gone and come to meet you and they're in your presence. So on the one hand, we grieve, but on the other hand, we rejoice because great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, oh God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the faithfulness of your people. We thank you for the generosity of your servants. We thank you, Lord, for the gifts of grace that you've afforded in the house of faith. Now, Lord, please continue to give us wisdom. Continue to give us insight. Continue to give us revelation, not just as we manage things that are known in the pandemic, etc. But Lord, help us to anticipate what the enemy might do and counteract that with the great fervor of the kingdom of God and the mighty Holy Ghost. Give us wisdom beyond our ability. Give us knowledge beyond our understanding. Give us skill beyond our capacity. Give us the anointing of God that we might do the work of God and be your hands and feet extended in this earth. Hallelujah. 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 We thank you, Lord. And so, Father, now as we open your word, Would you give us insight today, revelation and understanding? Help us to see our Father in heaven. Help us to see you correctly. Pull back the veil a little bit that we can see a little more and understand with great fervency and depth the beauty, the grace, the holiness, and the love of our Heavenly Father. And for this, we give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen Amen. and amen and amen. Turn to your neighbor and say, may the Lord speak to you this morning. And you be seated. It's okay. Turn to Luke 15. I want to talk to you about the value of something. And I want to speak to you about the covenant of God. In Luke, the 15th chapter, Jesus tells three stories. He tells the story of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son. And he speaks to them as a response to the dismissiveness of the Pharisees, who in verse number two said that this man welcomes sinners and even eats with them. That was a fact. He did welcome sinners and he did eat with them. But in their mind, it was a negative. It wasn't a positive. And so in in response to their dismissiveness, the great storyteller, the Lord Jesus, told three stories. 
The story again of the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the lost son. Now in your notes, I've put a blank there because I want you to understand something again. We only consider something to be lost if it has value to us. We only consider something to be lost if it has value to us. The key that is lost has value to me. My car this morning is parked, not in my parking spot. My car this morning is parked in the Oakland International Airport parking lot. Because my key is in my bag in my father's house in Southern California. About midnight last night, as I was walking out of the terminal to my car, it dawned on me that I had not really lost my key, but I knew exactly where it was, but I did not have it in my possession. Suddenly, I'm scrambling to rent a car. You say, well, why didn't you call Uber? Well, you know, guys, I have more to do than just get home. I had to get here. I had to get back. And all of a sudden, I'm running through all the things I have to do today, and, and, and renting a car was cheaper than an Uber. But they, the, the, the value ascribed created the depth of loss. Now, I tell that story at my own peril because some of you are going to be wondering about me, but I can't help that. When something or someone is valuable and they are removed from your life, then they are lost and you feel that loss. The depth of the loss is measured by the height of the value. The penny at the bottom of my briefcase is not lost. I don't care. It is a matter as to whether you value it is what makes it lost. Jesus tells a story in verse 11 of a man who has two sons. Now, oftentimes we call this the prodigal son and we, we focus on one of the sons. But that's not what Jesus is telling here. He's talking about two sons. Two-thirds of the story is based upon the prodigal, but another third of it is based upon the elder brother. So the story in Jesus' is telling is not just about the one. He spends a great deal of time talking about both. And there is a lostness to both. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. And so he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there he squandered his wealth on wild living. There is great danger in grabbing your inheritance early. First of all, it's not come to full fruition. You might be selling yourself short. Secondly, if you don't value what you receive, you will squander and lose it, and it won't be until after you've lost it that you recognize its value. It is better to recognize the value of something before it is lost than only understanding its value after it has been lost. That's really words of wisdom there. You might want to write that down because I didn't, so write it down and give it to me. Don't seek from God earlier than what God has for you. He has a timing for your life as well as a promise for your life. Don't sin the sin of the prodigal by demanding your father give you what you will get before you are ready to receive it. That's another sermon that we don't have time for today. But Verse 14. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the land. And he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. 
Again, everyone was hanging out with him when he was buying the party. But no one was there when he could no longer buy his own friends. You see, you find out how many friends you have when suddenly you're in the pigsty and it's your own fault. When he came to his senses, everybody said he came to his senses. Thank the Lord. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion. Everyone say compassion. He ran to his son. Say that phrase with me. He ran to his son. Threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine. Hallelujah. This son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Jesus pivots. The older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. The father valued the son. Therefore, the son was lost and dead. And when he returned, because the father valued the son, the father was filled with joy. But the brother did not value his brother the way the father had valued his son. He did not consider his brother lost and found. He did not consider his brother dead and alive. He considered his brother insolent and rebellious and who knows what other motivations he would ascribe to him. The bottom line is the brother did not look at his brother the way the father looked at both of them. The great tragedy in the church today is that we refuse to look at each other correctly. And if we cannot look at each other in the house of the Lord correctly, we certainly cannot look at the lost correctly. And what is correctly? Through the lens of the Father. If we see one another through the lens of activity, if we see one another through the lens of what they bring, in other words, if your value or my value is based upon what I give or what I do or what I say or how I am, if that is your value to me, then I am not finding you lost if I don't consider you a great contributor. But if I see you through the lens of the Father, if I see you with the heartache of the Father, 
If I see you with the brokenness of the Father, if I see you with this consideration of the Father, then you're more than the, the check you might write. You're more than the color of your skin. You're more than the socioeconomic status. You're more than the work you can do. You're more than the sum of your activities. You're more than the sum of your parts. You are a child of God. And every human being has so much value to the Father that he sent his Son. And if we, the church, will not look through the lens of value, we will not recognize how lost the world is. You see, I'm convinced today that one of the greatest problems we have with evangelism is that we just don't understand how lost people are. And we don't understand how painful that is to God. If you really believed that eternity awaits, you know, the Lord's coming back. But for most of us, he's coming back really soon. You say, what do you mean, Pastor? I'm, prob I'm probably not at midlife. The chances are I'm not going to 116. Sometime in the next 30, 40 years, I'm going to meet Jesus. Many of you are in that same situation of various degrees. The point is this. All of us have an appointment with eternity. All of us have an appointment with eternity. Whether it is the rapture of the church and we all go that way, which I'm actually praying for, wouldn't that be a day? Hallelujah. My whole life I've thought, what would it be like to hear that trumpet sound? But the dead in Christ rise too, so I'm going to hear it one way or the other. But here's the reality. Do we really believe that eternity is awaiting every human soul? And if we really believe that eternity is awaiting every human soul, why is our heart not filled with longing and concern and consideration for those whose eternity is a dark, eternal damnation away from God? The sin of the elder brother was he didn't value his little brother. Let's keep going. The older brother, verse 28, became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me. Everything I have is yours. Everything I have is yours. Not only did the elder son not see his brother correctly, he did not see his father correctly. And because he could not see his father correctly, he could not see himself correctly. He saw himself as nothing more than the best of the hired hands. He did not know he was the heir. He did not know that everything he had belonged to, that everything the father had belonged to him. 
He did not recognize his station in the ministry. He did not recognize his station in the house. He did not recognize that everything that the father had belonged to him. You see, this is a story of law versus grace. The elder son condemned, and rightfully so. Jesus doesn't justify the sinfulness of the young man. But he thinks that the young man's standing is based upon how poorly he behaved. And he thinks that his standing is based upon how well he has behaved. My friends, their standing was not based upon their activity. Their standing was based upon who their father was. Both were sons of the father. Jesus started the story that way. He said a man had two sons. He never said this one son was no longer his son or this other son was the better of his sons. A man had two sons. Neither of them understood the favor under which they were living. The one did not understand the favor of the blessing of the father's house and ran in rebellion. The other, while he never openly rebelled, never submitted his heart. The one took the father's inheritance and left. The other stayed, maybe even as a business decision, knowing that someday it would all be his. But the moment the father behaved in a manner that caused him ill, he openly rebelled against his father. He spoke to him in ways that he should not have. This son of yours, you didn't do one thing for me. I didn't even get a goat. You gave him a big old cow. How many times, because we're bound by law and not by favor, how many times have we witnessed the blessing of God in someone else's life and we said to ourselves, well, you never did that for me. Why do they get to drive that? Why do they get to do that? Why do they get to go there? Why do they have all their home and all their children all seem healthy and I got to struggle with this? How many times have we spoken ill of God? Because we've not understood favor. We've not understood that even in sorrow and difficulty, God is rich and plentiful. We've not understood that even when we walk through the hardest of battles, my father loves the old Andre Crouch song, Through It All. And he was, he, was say, he was not singing, but he was speaking that to me this week. And I was reminded of that because of the difficulties of this particular season for him, but just some of the difficulties of his life. But he looked at me and he says, you know, through it all, through it all, through it all, through it all, God has been good and God has been faithful and God has blessed me. And he, it's, it's a man who understood the favor of God. He understood that he didn't deserve any blessings. He understood he didn't deserve any credit. He understood he didn't deserve any favor. He understood that everything he has comes because God is good and God is kind and God is merciful and God is gracious. This father in our story has two sons who did not understand him and his ways. My son, you're always with me. Everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate. I love that. We had to celebrate. 
Don't you remember what Jesus told the Pharisees during the Palm Sunday, the triumphant entry? The Pharisees, again, under law, were very upset about the way and the protocol and the procedure of the children who were running around and all the other disciples disrupting things, taking off their coats, throwing them on the ground, taking off palm branches, throwing them on the ground. And the Pharisees said, this should not be. Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And what did Jesus say? He said, if they're silent, the rocks will cry out because we have to celebrate today. You have forgotten that the kingdom of God is a party. I'll say that again. You have forgotten that the kingdom of God is a party. Do you not even understand? Even our funerals are parties. Why? Because we know they're not here. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. The kingdom of God is a celebration. God is good. Eternity is for all. Death is defeated. The grave is destroyed. The king reigns forever. Our bad days are good days. Our hard days are good days. We believe in miracles. Oh, I want a miracle. I want a miracle. I want a miracle. Then look for the problems to be opportunities because you can't have a miracle without a problem being miraculously made, made right. Amen? Amen? We had to celebrate. Can I do a Father's Day message two Sundays? Okay. Since I haven't gotten through the text yet. We had to celebrate and be glad. Oh, church, I think sometimes the Lord just wants to jump in the middle of your family and in the middle of your life and look you in the eye. I think like a parent to a child, I think there are times the Lord just wants to kind of do this and get down in your face and say, would you smile? Would you be glad? Oh, Lord, you don't know how much rent is. Yes, I do. You don't know this. You don't know that. I know it all. Would you be glad? You have a greater salvation than words could explain. You have a greater salvation than money could buy. You have a greater salvation and a greater favor than all of your activity and all of your work could ever produce. Would you rejoice and be glad? Oh, my sons, let us be glad. Amen. I could stop there. I won't, but I could. Why this brother of yours? Remember what he had said? This son of yours. Oh, no. You're not getting away with that. This brother of yours. You don't get to dismiss people you don't like. Ah, those Republicans. Oh, no, no, no. Jesus died for them. Ah, those Democrats. Oh, no, 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 no. Jesus died for them. Communists died for them, too. Socialists died for them, too. Capitalists, oh, yeah, died for them, too. Why don't, I don't like the pigmentation of their skin. Jesus died for them. Well, they're not as important as that person. Oh, that's not how Jesus looks at it. The ground at the foot of the cross is level. God is addressing something in the church right now. He is addressing a calloused dismissiveness of human value, human worth, and human souls. 
He's addressing the fact that we've allowed the world to divide us by so many different things, and we think we, we stand in, in such peril of our own self-righteousness. I, I'm old enough now to remember when the, when the great cry against the church by the secular community was, you guys are all just holier than thou. You just all think you're goody two-shoes. You all think you're, you're better than everybody else. They don't say that anymore. You know why? Because they're all acting that way now. We don't get to dismiss people because they disagree with us. That book says, love your enemies. Not just your friends. Not just your tribe. Not just those who agree with you. In their own house. In this father's house that Jesus is describing. You had two sons. One wanted away from the other one faster than he could get away. And when he came back in humility, the other one was so angry and loathsome that he wouldn't, now watch this, he would not even enter into the house which was his house. How many times have people gotten so hurt in church? How many times have they gotten so angry in church? How many times have they gotten so, how many times have some of you gotten so upset at somebody in church. He said, I'm not going to go. Oh, like that really helps. I'm not going to be around. How many times have you ever gotten mad at a pastor? And he said, oh, I'm never, I'm not, I, that pastor hurt me. You, my friends, we deal with people 20, 30, 40 years not going to church. Their life is miserable. And we say, hey, let, let's work together. Let's enter into the fellowship of the house of the Lord. Let's encourage one another. Let's bless one another. Let's be with one another. And they'll tell it, no, that church is full of this and full of that. And they did this and they did that. Look at what the enemy has done. We have sinned the sin of the elder brother. We won't even go into the party of the Lord because we're mad at somebody else that's in there. Get it together. I'm serious. Get it together. Quit being so mad at somebody. You don't have time. You don't have time. You don't have time. The world and all of its riches are fading away. Jesus is coming. It's time for the glorious body of the living Christ to start acting like we are disciples of Jesus. And Jesus said, by this, they will know you are my disciples if you love one another. You may not understand everything the Father's doing. You may not understand why you didn't get a goat and this guy's got a fatted calf. But the father is the father. And you're not the father. Turn to your neighbor and say, you are not God. And you don't get to play one. Not on TV, not in church. We are his children. We are his heirs. I'd like to fill in one more blank. This is a story about law and grace. This is a story about covenant. This brother of yours was dead. And now he's alive. He was lost. And now he's found. This narrative is rich. It teaches us about short-sighted rebellion. I'm not going in that party. I want all that's mine, I'm out of here. Short-sighted rebellion. It teaches us about authentic repentance. I find it interesting that the issue is a little open with the elder brother. It's a story of power of redemption. 
It's also a story of covenant. The covenant heart of the Father. Look at verse 20 with me again, this time from the Good News Translation. He got up and started back to his father. He was still a long way from home when his father saw him. His heart was filled with pity. He ran. Something a patriarch would not do in that culture. For Jesus to say this caught everybody with a, what? He ran and threw his arms around his son. And kissed him. Again, this is a story of law versus grace. This is a story of of, of, of wages versus favor. The wages are earnings. And the Bible says the only earning you can have is the wages of sin is death. But the gift, the favor of God is eternal life. Nothing that either son could do could earn them the place of sonship. Neither repentance nor faithfulness could earn sonship. I'm going to say that again. Neither the repentance of the prodigal or even the faithfulness of the elder brother earned them sonship. Their inheritance their power, their capacity, their wealth, their standing, were not dependent upon what they did. It was dependent upon who the Father was. So this is a story about the Father. We call it the prodigal son, but it's actually a story about the Father. A man, that's who Jesus creates the subject. A man had two sons. Jesus is telling the story about the Father. And he's telling the story about his heavenly Father. His Father. A man had two sons. And the first thing that I'd like to point out, and the last thing today that I'd like to point out, number one in your notes, is that there's a consistency to God. There is a consistency to God. I am the Lord God, I change not. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Faithfulness is measured by consistency. The father knew that his youngest son, though an adult, had made a foolish and selfish request. Yet he allowed him to go his own way. You know, my friends, God grants you and I access to heaven or hell if we choose it. This is true in the nature of life, isn't it? We train, we love, we give. And still many times our children will not make the correct decisions in life. Sometimes they are rebellious. Sometimes it's short-sightedness of youth. Sometimes it's the curiosity of inexperience. The lure of the unknown. But most of us in this room have also disappointed our Heavenly Father. Anyone? Anyone? Okay. Nevertheless, regardless of our inconsistency, He is consistent. Regardless of our faithlessness, he remains faithful. This is the power that allows repentance, the place in our, in our walk and in our journey. It is not the repentance that saves us. It is the repentance that brings us to the one who can save us. It is the faithfulness of God. It is the consistency of the Father in this particular story. Look what Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 2. This is a faithful and trustworthy saying. If we died with him, we will also live with him. This is the promise of the cross. If we endure with him, we will also reign with him. This is the promise of the overcomer. If we deny him, he will also deny us. This is the promise of liberty. 
of freedom, of free will. Verse 13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. Why? He remains true to his word and his righteous character. Why? Because he cannot deny himself. Hallelujah. He cannot deny himself. Faithfulness, consistency is who he is. In other words, it matters not how everyone else behaves. God is going to behave like God. He's never going to do anything that is unrighteous. He's never going to do anything that is unholy. He's never going to do anything that is wrong. He's never going to do anything that is vindictive. He's never going to do anything that is callous or indifferent or cold or disheartening. It matters not how you treat him. He will be faithful to himself. To do otherwise would deny his character. To do otherwise would deny his divinity. To do otherwise would deny that he is a righteous God. He is the Lord God. He changes not. And it is that consistency that is the bulwark of our faith. Without a consistent God, we have no hope. Without a faithful father, we have no chance. It is this consistency that allows the opportunity when the lost come to their senses. Verse 17, he came to his senses. We have a promise. Every one of you look at me for a moment. The promise is this, Acts 16, 31. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved and all your family. Say that to yourself. And my family. Pray the names of your children, their spouses, their children, their children's children. They shall be saved. Why? Because God is consistent. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm not always consistent. I'm not always right. My attitude's not always good. I'm not always what I should be. But I serve a God who is always faithful, always righteous, always merciful. In coming to his senses, the young man did not consider how to improve the pigsty. He did not blame his father. He did not blame his brother. He did not blame his friends. He did not blame his boss. He did not blame the pigs. He recognized that his misery was his. And without focusing on the misery, he chose to focus on the consistency of his father. It is the consistency of a father watching on the horizon. You say, well, why didn't the father go pursue the son? For the father did go with the son. When the son left, it was the character of the father that went with him. It was the words of the father that went with him. It was the wealth of the father that went with him. It was the hope of the father that went with him. It was the knowledge of the father that went with him. The father is not going to bless your mess. He's not going to get in the middle of your pigsty and improvement and improve it. He will give you the way home, however. And he'll be waiting there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And in fact, if you'll take one step, he'll run to you. But that's next Sunday. He will run to you. He will run to your children. He will run to your grandchildren. He will run to you. He will run to your family because this is who he is. But I want you to see something before we end today. Worship team, please come take your place.
My friends, you can always go home. Listen to me, dads. Listen to me, parents. Listen to me, sisters, who you play the dual role of, of, of managing your household as both mom and dad. Listen to me. Make sure your children know the way home. Make sure they know the way home. Make sure they know the way home. Why? Because the Lord's going to make sure they come to their senses. He will bring them. He will bring them. How do you know that? He promised it. Look at Isaiah 43. I will reunite you with your children. I'll bring them back from wherever in the world they are. Hallelujah. East, west, north, or south, no place will be able to hold you when I demand your release. Hallelujah. When I order them, bring my children, my sons and daughters from far away. Oh, my friends, there is no soul that is too lost. There is no child or grandchild that is too broken. There is no moment that is too important to bypass the great gift of consistently and prayerfully awaiting the Lord's grace upon your children and your grandchildren. No one earns their place in the Father's family. It's the working of the Father. But it is His consistency, His compassion, His covenant. that is both the motive and the means of redemption. Your God loves you with an extravagant love. They sang about it, reckless love. Your God loves you with a consistent love. Your God is faithful when you've been faithless. Your God cherishes you when you've been dismissive of Him. Your God cares about you more than you could imagine if you had a thousand lifetimes to ponder it. He sees you as more than what you do. He sees you as more than where you've been. You're more than the color of your skin. You're more than your ancestral line. You're more than your bank account. You're more than the car you drive, the place you live. You're more than the services you render. What are you? You're his heir. You're an heir of God and a co-heir with Jesus Christ. I want to pray for you today. I want to pray for some of you who can't see yourself correctly. And the reason you can't see yourself correctly is you're not seeing your God correctly. And so you can't see yourself or your brother and sister correctly. How many of you would say, Pastor, would you please pray for me today? This isn't just for dads right now. Would you please pray for me today? I hear what you're saying about God's love for me and his consistency. But if I were to be really, really honest, I believe that as it applies to everybody else. 
but I have a hard time receiving that I am the apple of his eye, that I am the object of his affection. How many of you would say, pray for me? Pray for me. How many of you would say, Pastor, I've been raised in a house of grace, the house of the Lord. And yet, so much of my thinking is clouded, not by favor, but by works. Don't get me wrong. Godly favor produces really good works. But really good works will never produce godly favor. That's the great change that has to take place in our mind. I do good works by God's grace because I'm under favor. I can't do good works to get favor. I can only present myself to him and ask for favor. How many of you would pray and say, Pastor, pray with me? I'm in the house of grace, but I'm living like I'm in the temple of law. And I need favor. Amen. Amen. And finally, and this one's a little harder, but how many of you would be honest enough to say, Pastor, I got to look at people differently. I got to look at brothers and sisters differently. I got to look at politicians differently. I got to look at people in the store differently. I got to look at people through the lens of my father. Would you hold your hand up? I think there's more of you than that, but I can't see very far. All right. God bless you. Let's pray for these three things, and then we'll dismiss with a time of prayer for dads. Father, in the name of Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Lord, that this story that your son told so exemplifies your character and so demonstrates two of the great pitfalls of our own fallen nature. Oh, Lord, there's a part of me that wants to just take your blessings and run and then go do my own thing with your blessings. And because, Lord, I haven't valued it and don't mature in it, I'll squander it. I'll squander the life. I'll squander the energy. I'll squander the prosperity. I'll squander these things because I, I, I have this rebellious streak, Lord, that, that wants your blessing but doesn't want your rulership. I want to take what I think is mine and I rebel and I ask you, Lord, forgive me for that tendency. And then, Lord, there's this other part of me that, that does want to serve you and, and work hard for you and do things in your house and do things for your kingdom, not realizing that you've already given me all things. I'm, I'm trying to earn, 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 and then when I'm disappointed, Lord God, I blame you. I act as if you owed me something. I'll even say things like, well, I prayed and prayed and prayed and nothing happened, as, as though you owed me. I didn't understand favor. I didn't understand grace. So, Lord, we pray together today. Help us to see you correctly. Take down the, the barriers and the walls and the blinding things that cause us not to see and help us to see our Heavenly Father through the lens of Jesus Christ. Help us to see you as consistent. And Lord, not, not as it means for others. Lord, I, 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 I need to learn that this applies to me. That you love me, you love us. You don't just love those people or them. You don't just love someone in a condition that, that we think might be worthy of sympathy or worthy of compassion. You love us. 
And so, Father, I pray for a great, overwhelming sense of favor in the name of Jesus. Favor in the name of Jesus. These are your children. They live in the house of favor. They live in the house of blessing. They live in the house of grace. We will not be enslaved. Freedom, 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 not to go our own way, but freedom to rejoice in our Father's house. Freedom to celebrate. Freedom to be glad. Freedom to be happy. Freedom to look at every obstacle as an opportunity. Freedom to look at every disease as a potential healing. Freedom to look at every difficulty as a glorious unveiling of the powerful arm of the risen Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, we, we want to look at each other differently. We want to see each other correctly. We want to see each other through the lens of grace and the lens of favor. We want to love our enemies. We want to bless those who disagree. We want to encourage those who don't know you yet. Oh, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we don't want to live in a pigsty. We want people to know how they can get out of that. Oh, Father, help us to be consistent like you. Help us to be faithful like you. Help us to do as you do in Jesus' name. So, Lord, we want to see you correctly. We want to see ourselves correctly. And we want to see the lost and the hurting, but also those within the house of God correctly. Lord, in the name of Jesus, there are those who are listening online. They're trying to stay connected with you, but they've got old wounds within the house of God. And they're, and they're staying outside of the party because they're mad at someone who's in the party. In the name of Jesus, would you break that? Would you destroy that stronghold in people's lives? And Father, would there be a celebration in their heart today, a rejoicing in the salvation that is so great. Now, Father, bring our sons and our daughters, our grandsons and our granddaughters, our great-grandsons and our great-granddaughters from the north. We command you, give them up from the south. We command you in Jesus' name, let them go from the east and from the west. We declare in the name of the Lord that the Lord is gathering his children. Bring this harvest. And I thank you, Father. Hallelujah.